Well, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, organizers of this meeting for inviting me to be here. Uh, the title of my talk is Over the Rolling Hills and Into Flatland, Methods to Measure and Correct Non-Uniform Fluorescence Illumination. And I promise you that the uh, title and the picture associated with this first slide will make more sense to you by the end of the talk. So let's take a look at where we came from. Uh, some of the original microscopes didn't even have a light source. You had to use sunlight or a candle to focus down and illuminate your sample. Uh, you didn't have a stage. You only had a small pick to, to hold your sample. And I imagine focusing would have been very difficult with a device like this. And there was no way to record your images. You simply had to look through the eyepiece and draw what you saw by hand. Nowadays, fluorescent microscopes have come a long way, uh, and in particular, confocal microscopes. These are really analytical instruments cap capable of producing multidimensional quantitative data. So what we're doing is actually mapping out uh, cellular landscapes in three dimensions, or four dimensions with time, or five dimensions when we, or, or, or higher dimensions when we look at different spectral channels as well. And I would argue to you that the quality of the data is reflected in the quality of the image and how that image was captured and processed thereafter. So at the end of the day, you have to remember that your images are really just tables of, of data. And contained within those tables are the, the, the biology that we want to understand. The data to understand the biology is there. And the guiding principle that we usually go by is that any given pixel intensity is somehow proportional to the local concentration of the fluorophore that's attached to the protein or the biomolecule that you're trying to study. But you have to be careful because there are about 39 or, or more factors that are internal to the imaging system that have to remain constant in order for that relationship to be true. And this is very well documented in uh, an article that was written by James Pauley, uh, which was jokingly titled after an old Alfred Hitchcock movie, uh, The 39 Steps, A Cautionary Tale of Quantitative Three-Dimensional Fluorescence Microscopy. Now I'm going to only talk about one of those factors today, that being the illumination uniformity. So let me illustrate the problem with an example. Here's a fluorescence image of two uh, fluorescence microspheres. And if you look at this, you can see that the, the sphere on the left is slightly brighter than the one on the right. Now, we can be more quantitative about this. We can go in and draw a line profile and look at the pixel intensities. And in this case, we can see that the, pix, uh, the, the bead on the, the left actually does have uh, an intensity that's about 35% greater than the one on the right. Now, all would be fine and well, except that I lied to you. Uh, the bead that you saw, the beads that you saw in the previous image is actually the same bead. I simply snapped an image of the bead in the middle of my field of view, and then I translated it down over to the bottom left-hand corner and snapped another picture, and then I put them together. So how is this possible? How can we get, be getting different intensities from the same bead uh, if all things being equal, if our camera detector is giving us a linear response, if there isn't any photo bleaching going on, or laser power is constant during, during the acquisition? How is this possible? Well, you get a sense of the problem if you look at a field of view that has uh, many hundreds of fluorescent beads, all with roughly the same fluorescence intensity because it's a little bit difficult to uh, view an image like this with a white background. Let me put it uh, with a lookup table that's colored a little bit differently. Now you can see the problem, that there's a hot spot in the illumination profile, such that beads in the middle appear brighter than the ones on the corner. So there's a gradient in the illumination uh, off to the edges. So the lesson, of course, is that non-uniform illumination is going to result in non-uniform fluorescence. And if that's the case, our uh, relationship that there's uh, 
proportionality between the signal intensity and the floor four concentration is not true. Now, quantification is not the only problem that you're going to run into. Um, there are other types of artifacts that you may encounter later on when you're trying to process your images. So most, if not all, um, image processing algorithms uh, assume that your images have been captured with uh, perfect flat illumination. But if that's not the case, uh, as illustrated here in this example, where we have some black blobs, never mind what they are, but you can clearly see that on the case on the left, they're not illuminated uniformly, whereas the, one, the image on the right, it is. If we then go and ask the computer to count uh, the number of black blobs in, in these images, and if we try and do that based on just basic thresholding, you're going to run into some problems when the illumination is not flat, as you can see. And there are even cases where uh, two blobs are actually counted as one blob. Another type of uh, artifact that people sometimes have to deal with is when they want to look at large objects at high resolution over many different fields of view. Uh, so there are some people, and there's this an example here from the Allen Brain Institute, where they're literally trying to create a Google map of the brain, so to speak. And so they have to be very concerned about how the images line up with each other. And if they want to reconstruct um, large images like these in three dimensions, they can sometimes run into errors at, at the edges of, of individual tiled images. So what are the causes of non-uniform illumination? Well, I tried to create a list of the usual suspects here. Uh, some people will say that chromatic or spherical aberration can play a role. Sometimes the lens uh, field curvature associated with the objective can lead to non-uniform illumination. If we're talking about laser scanning confocal microscopy, uh, the raster scanning motion of the galvanometric mirrors can sometimes be off, which can lead to uh, uh, non-uniform illumination. Uh, a bad optical alignment or stray light obviously play a role. Uh, but the main culprit, which is the one that I'll talk a little bit more about, is that the light source itself usually has an inhomogeneity associated with it. And this is a talk about non-uniform illumination, but I need to remind you that there's actually two halves to this problem. You really always have to think about it in terms of excitation and emission. So what I'm trying to say here is that there is actually, uh, there could be non-uniformities in the detection as well. Uh, some examples of that are optical vignetting or clipping of the beam of light that passes through your microscope. Um, any dust or imperfections on the optics will, will show up as dark spots in your image. Um, we've learned that there can actually be non-uniform transmission through your filters and your dichroics. And again, if we're talking about laser scanning confocal microscopy, the pinhole alignment plays a big role in this. And finally, I, I've, I've also seen some cases where uh, um, artifacts from how back-thin CCDs are made, uh, based on, on how they're polished, can sometimes create some very strange image patterns in, in your images as well. So what, when it comes to the illumination aspect of this, what can we do? Well, I look at it and say there's, there's two possible solutions. There are software solutions which try to correct the problem after the images have been acquired. And then there are hardware solutions which try to optically or physically remove or minimize any source of non-uniformity. And I'll, I'll show you a few examples of both of these. So on the software side, there are some computational approaches where they actually try to determine what the uh, non-uniform illumination looks like by sampling regions uh, uh, in the background which are not part of the object that you're trying to look at. And that's usually fit to some kind of quadratic surface, which you can then take with your original image, subtract the calculated illumination, and then you get a very nice flat uh, uh, image uh, on the bottom left here. So we can try this with uh, the real data that we've acquired. Um, there are many such algorithms like this available. And one such algorithm is the rolling ball background subtraction, which you can find in image J. 
And you can see here on the right, this is what image J thinks my illumination profile looks like based on the original data that's contained in the image on the left. And we could go ahead and perform the uh, al algorithm and we get a corrected image, which looks pretty good. Uh, you can still see that there's some uh, problems with now the, the uh, intensities in the background. Uh, but if we're going for a visual correction of the image, this is pretty good. But at the same time, we have to recognize that the quantitative nature of the data has changed a little bit now. Now, instead of computationally calculating what the background is, you can actually measure it using a standard uh, fluorescent sample or, or a test slide. And um, now many people probably are familiar with the free plastic slides that are handed out at trade shows, but uh, I will show you that there's actually reasons to move over to these uh, concentrated dye solutions, which were uh, an idea put forward by Mike Model at uh, Kent State University. There's some advantages associated with these types of slides, which I'll show you. Um, the main advantage is that these slides are so optically dense that when you illuminate them with a fluorescence microscope, they only produce fluorescence from a very thin region immediately adjacent to the cover slip. How thin? It's actually uh, thinner than the diffraction limit that's associated with the objective that you're using to image uh, the dye slide. Um, and so you can actually go in and do a Z stack on a sample like this, and you see that it produces a perfectly flat, uh, planar source of fluorescence. So there is dye located in the regions above this planar surface, uh, but again, because it's so optically dense, light is completely absorbed, and any fluorescence from that region is just quenched. You don't see it. The other nice thing about these samples is that there are different dyes available for different excitation emission uh, combinations. So you can use fluorescein, um, or you can use rose bengal. These are common dyes used in pathology. So uh, again, I said we can actually use these to measure what the illumination uniformity of your system looks like. Uh, and in this case, we can draw a corner-to-corner -corner line profile and quantify it through an index which I call the percent roll-off. Uh, it doesn't really have an official name. But what you do is simply fit a, a, a polynomial to the data on that corner-to-corner -corner line profile. And it's really just a ratio of the maximum fitted intensity to uh, the minimum that you find on the edges expressed as a percentage. And in this case, it's actually quite bad. Uh, this microscope uh, has a, a percent roll-off of almost 70%. Uh, this, is, this is really terrible. Uh, but again, once we, once we know what that uh, profile looks like, we can again use this for some kind of software correction of any non-uniformity in a real image. And uh, there are many, again, many different algorithms that you can do uh, to uh, apply uh, this type of correction. And we can go ahead and do that using this equation uh, shown down here on the right. And again, we get a very good image uh, coming back. Uh, but the, again, there's some un uncertainty associated with how do we multiply this image back up into our dynamic range with the value, uh, the correction constant C, um, and, and it makes it difficult to compare images that are collected uh, in different fields of view or, or different, uh, uh, different replicate uh, experiments. So uh, although these software solutions work, there, there are some disadvantages associated with them. We would have to do these types of calibration experiments periodically uh, because those illumination patterns may shift over time. This is a time-consuming and computationally demanding process. And again, as I, as I mentioned, the quantitative nature of the images are being altered uh, in some cases. So uh, a hardware solution where you don't even have to worry about the problem is always going to be much better. And now let me show you a few examples of that. So if we're talking about just regular wide-field epifluorescence imaging, well, there's a solution that's existed for almost 100 years. This is, of course, Kohler illumination, which was developed by uh, August Kohler. And, and there, the, the idea is fairly simple, which says that if you have 
a light source that is inhomogeneous, such as an arc lamp, and, and this is definitely the case. The whole point of Kohler illumination is to transfer an image of that light source to the objective rear or back focal plane, such that what appears at your specimen plane is a completely defocused image of that light source, and it will be very flat. And then, of course, we can see what it is we're trying to look at, uh, and, and the image will have a flat background as well. Now, what about confocal microscopy? Or, in this case, in particular, spinning disc confocal microscopy? Does color illumination really apply in this case? Well, no, because it's, it's, we have completely different um, optical light paths associated with devices like these on the left. This is the Yokogawa CSU, which is probably one of the most popular devices for live cell imaging. And um, there are some, some issues associated with devices like these. The reality is that all of the images I've been showing you so far were actually collected with a CSU right out of the box, straight from the factory. So there is non-uniformities associated with devices like these. And now the question is, where is that non-uniformity being produced? Is it part of the whole microscope system, or is it something inherent to the system itself, uh, the individual CSU unit? So we can test this by remembering that if we detach the CSU from the microscope and recognize that the pinhole plane is a conjugate image plane, so what we see over here is exactly what we see uh, being transferred to the specimen plane, we can set up our own imaging optics and look at the illumination profile directly with a beam profiler CCD camera. And uh, many people in the industry use these devices to, to measure with high precision uh, laser beam profiles. So we can look at the pinholes and then start the disc spinning and we can see what's coming out. And again, I'll put this on a color scale that's easier for you to see. And yes, it's bad. There, there's definitely hot spots associated with the direct uh, illumination coming out of the CSU. Uh, now, what are the reasons for that? Well, it mainly stems from the fact that uh, the CSU uses a single mode optical fiber with a very specific numerical aperture. Um, so we can, again, quantify this the exact same way, way we did with the die slides uh, using this setup. At 405 nanometers, we find that the CSU has a percent roll-off of about 24%, which is not so bad if, if you're satisfied with throwing, off, uh, throwing away all the information at the edges of your images. You, you could do reasonable quantification in the center at this wavelength. But as we increase the laser illumination wavelength to, say, 491 nanometers, that roll-off increases to 31%. At 561 nanometers, that illumination profile is now even shifted a little bit, and it's increased more to 44%. And at 642 nanometers, we're at 64%. Uh, this is really terrible. And um, I can recolor that lookup table more coarsely, such that uh, the color orange here now represents only 10% roll-off. So if you were satisfied that you could do good quantification at that level, you look at the illumination profile and you realize that that's only 19% of your usable CCD area. Now that's some pretty expensive real estate, given the fact that you pay tens of thousands of dollars for detectors like these. So that is not an effective use of the device. Uh, especially at this wavelength. So this is where the company that I work for, uh, Spectral Applied Research, comes in. Uh, we jokingly refer to ourselves as like the Harley Davidson of microscopy. And by that I mean we do complete customized jobs. We take the Yokogawa CSU and we modify it, we, Im we improve its capabilities. And we call that improvement uh, in, in one package we call it Borealis. Now, Borealis provides a number of advantages over the regular CSU. Uh, you get a better uh, throughput of excitation light through the system. There's some improvements on the detection sensitivity and the alignment stability. Uh, we allow you to extend the range of wavelengths that can be used with the this device. 
and you can change the pinhole sizes and there are alternate configurations available but actually one of the best benefits of Borealis is that it provides better illumination uniformity. Now how is that possible? Uh, it mainly is due to the fact that we completely change some of the optics that are used to deliver light through the system and we use a proprietary optical fiber with a very specific uh, diameter and numerical aperture associated with that. So how much better are we doing? Again, we can quantify this. We can look at the roll-off. At 405 nanometers, we're all the way down at 4%. And 491 nanometers, again, 4%. 561 nanometers, we've actually dropped a little bit to 3.7%. And at 642 nanometers, where the Yokogawa was showing a, a very bad roll-off, again, we're still only down at 3.4%. And these little yellow spots you may see here on the image on the left, those are just dust particles on the dichroic or, or the camera. So uh, in the end, on the left, these are the rolling hills I've been talking about. On the right, Borealis, this is flatland. This is where you want to be. And again, we can look at the same field of view of fluorescent beads. When you look at this with Borealis, you can now see that all those fluorescent beads have roughly the same intensity. There's been no additional computational processing of this image. We can even look at the dye slides again. These are now presented with the same contrast scale. Uh, previously, I showed you that Yokogawa uh, had a percent roll-off of almost 70% at, at that wavelength, 642 nanometers. And this is with the acid blue 9 concentrated dye solution. With Borealis, we see there's actually a very slight increase to about 8% roll-off. Uh, this little roll-off in the corner, we suspect, is actually due to an uh, inhomogeneous transfer of light through the filter that we're using. Um, but at the end of the day, we can guarantee that with Borealis, there will be a percent roll-off of less than 10% across the field of view, and that will be with all illumination wavelengths that you're using. So here we are again at the rolling hills. This is where most of us are probably doing our imaging today, but this is where you want to be, in the nice, calm, flatland. So I'll finish off by saying that what you really want to do is take your microscope to a place like this. I showed you that there were two roads to get there. There's a software road, there's a hardware road, and I made the argument to you that the hardware road is a little bit easier because you don't have to deal with any computational corrections to your images after you've collected them. I said that you should break out a map and see where you are when, on your trip uh, to flatland. And by that, I mean you can measure the percent roll-off of, of your microscope system using either dye solutions or beam profiler cameras. And I say once you get to flat land, enjoy the scenery. And by that, I mean look at the better images you're going to get, which will lead to better quantification and better image processing. And of course, that means that you're, you're going to have better results for the science that you're trying to study. So why not book a trip to Flatland with us? Um, we're in your neighborhood, near Highway 7 in Leslie, which is literally just the backyard uh, of Toronto in Richmond Hill. We're fully set up to do these types of measurements and more than happy to do a demo for you. Um, so come on up to Spectral Applied Research and visit us anytime or contact us um, at www.spectral.ca if you'd like to learn any bit more about uh, Borealis or some of the other products that we uh, uh, provide. Thank you very much.